You know, one of the greatest things I've seen in the Bible is in uh, um, Mark 11, where Jesus said that whatsoever you ask in, the name, in my name, what, if you believe and do not doubt, you know, you will have whatever you ask. Okay? If you believe and you ask, then you will receive whatsoever you ask. Now, in the Greek, this is what it says. If you ask and believe that you have received it, then you will have it. Now, that sounds wrong, because how can you get something that you have? Okay, so what he was talking about there is not having, he was talking about manifestation. Because we have. Um, and if, if that's true, if what Jesus says is true in Mark 11, that you must first believe that you have it, so that you can believe in what you have, and then you'll have it, what does that mean as pertaining to what we preach to the lost? Because how can they receive righteousness if they can't first believe that they are righteous, and how does that determine what we preach? You need to preach them as righteous in order for them to believe that they have righteousness, in order for them to have righteousness. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, that is what we need to preach. That's why we come with the good news of our salvation. We don't preach to a person, God will save you from the law. We preach that God has saved mankind from the law. Okay? We preach that God has taken away all the sin of all people. That's what we preach. So they can believe that they have it. And you must preach it in such a convincing way that they are persuaded that they have it and that, they, you know, that it is already theirs. And in the persuasion of that truth, then you will find that that truth will be raised up in their life through the gate or the access we have into it called faith. That's what Romans 5 teaches. So what I want to tell you today is it's so important to understand the fulfillment of the law. It's so important to understand what God has done for us. It's so important to understand certain terminologies in the Bible if we read the Bible, which is you know, things like what does it mean to be in the spirit, what does it mean to be in the flesh. Now, let's get into the message. Okay, what does it mean to be in the flesh? First of all, if we go look at uh, Genesis, God comes and He says to Abraham that you will be circumcised in the flesh. Now, that's where the whole in the flesh thing comes from. We always thought that in the flesh means you had a glass of wine at a wedding. <laughs> that's what we thought in the flesh is. Or um, you wake up at nine in the morning when you're supposed to wake up at six and then it means you're in the flesh. You know. Um, and, and that's what we were thinking. But the, the Jews never had an understanding of in the flesh as committing sins. They never, no Jew ever, had the mindset of when he sins, he is in the flesh. Never. Paul came with a revelation, which we're going to talk about in Romans 7 now, um, which to me is like the pivot point of understanding the gospel, Romans 7. Um, and, and he got a revelation of a new law, and we, which I will explain today. But the Jews, if you came to a Jew and you said to him, you're in the flesh, then he will say, I know and I'm proud of it. That's what he would say. Because they believed that they were, and this was what in the flesh meant. I was circumcised in the flesh, okay, First of all, before you could be circumcised, you had to be a Jew or an Israelite. Okay? You had to be an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, physical descendant of Abraham in the flesh. And then God had a covenant with Abraham. Then the sign that they in the flesh were part of that covenant because they were Israelites was circumcision. Okay? It was, I had to be circumcised. So the circumcision was a sign that I'm already part of a certain covenant because of Abraham. And I am of the physical descendants, I'm a physical descendant of Abraham, so this is the sign. That was what the whole in the flesh meant. Then the Jews believed that because, or the, the Israelites, they believed, we as, and, and Jews are actually a, a, a descendants of Judah, the tribe Judah, but if I say Jews, I mean Israelites. So, these Jews, what they believed was that Jesus would come and then he would be, uh, there will be a physical reign of the Messiah uh, and then the Jews will be the head nation and all the other nations would be, would be made their slaves. That's what they believed. That's why they focused 
on the flesh. They focused on, I am in the flesh. They focused on, you know, I am proud of being a Jew. I am in the flesh. I'm proud of it. Because that meant that the Messiah comes for me. Because I'm a Jew. And, and I'm all of that in the flesh. And when the Messiah comes for me, the, 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 the reign of the Messiah was called the Olam Haba, which, which meant, you know, that he will physically come to the earth. That's why, you know, they could not believe that he would die. Because he would, they would come, he, he would come, then those that obeyed the law well would have higher positions in this whole um, system, you know. And then those that didn't really obey, they would go to hell for a maximum of, well, maximum of 11 months. That's what they believed. You, know? you can go and read it up today. Um, I, when I did my study on this, this is what I read. That they didn't believe that the hell was forever because flesh superseded and that was just a, a purification place where you would then come and because the flesh is what gives you your access into heaven. That's what they believed, or access into the reign of the Messiah. They didn't actually believe so much in heaven. They believed in the reign of the Messiah. And they also believed that when this Messiah comes, the dead will be raised. The, the, the dead Jews, you know, they will be raised, and then they will reign with him over all these other nations in a physical reign, like we would have the, you know, years ago, the Germans that wanted to take over the world, you know, or the English that want to take over the world, and they wanted to reign. That's what they believed, and which they still believe. And that is what it means to a Jew when you talk about being in the flesh. And that's what Paul meant when he talked about boasting in the flesh or being in the flesh. Now, when, when you were in the flesh, then, this is what the Jews believed, when I'm in the flesh, then I was blessed with having the, the law given to me. Now, when I, when I say law, I'm referring to the Ten Commandments or the 613 or 14, whatever, laws that they were given to the Jews. They didn't see it as a type and a shadow of some kingdom sometime. They saw it as the reality of now. And then everybody will have to fall into that system. That's what they saw. There was no other way. That was the end for them. That was not a temporal system. The way they believed was... We are in the flesh, descendants of Abraham. God chose us as his only people. And we, were, we are circumcised as a sign of, of that covenant and that we accept it. You had to be a Jew. You had to be circumcised. Then you qualified to be a person that can go and read and obey the law for a high quality of life in this world. So the law was not given to Gentiles in written format. It was given to the Jews. And that is the whole understanding of Paul when it comes to the flesh. When he said you are in the flesh, it meant you boasted in the fact that you are a, Gentile, that you are a Jew and that the law was given to you. That was what it meant to be in the flesh. But Paul comes in Romans 7, and I'm going to read it for you, and, and, and he, he got this awesome revelation. And, you know, without understanding that, we cannot understand why Jesus, why the circum, what's the type and the shadow of circumcision? We can't, can't understand any of those things. Now, Jesus, let me just talk quickly about the circumcision. Jesus, when he was the fulfillment of circumcision, and we're going to read that as well here, I think it's in Colossians, where it says that we've got a circumcision of the heart in the circumcision of Christ. Now, what does that mean? When a person was circumcised, when a man was circumcised, circumcised, a piece of his flesh was cut away as a sign of the covenant. So when Jesus came to the earth and he died, flesh was cut away. And what does that mean to the Jewish mind to say the whole thing of being in the flesh is now cut away? It meant, I, it meant the law means nothing now? It means being a Jew means nothing. All those things means nothing all of a sudden. I can't be in the flesh anymore for Jesus was the cutting away of the flesh. And now when we get circumcised, 
The Bible says it's a circumcision of the heart, wherein the flesh is cut away out of your belief now, where you don't believe anymore that a Jew is a special person because of his flesh, and you don't believe in the law as anything significant unto salvation as pertaining to your obedience to the law. That's what it means. So when we are in the flesh... You know, um, we need to understand these things. And, and, and or, or when we say somebody's in the flesh, or when we read about in the flesh, we need to understand the context of being in the flesh. I found many people, and, uh, you know, and, and it, it took God some years to get me to really understand this thing of what it means to be in the flesh. If I ask a preacher, what do, what's your concept of being in the flesh? It always ends up to you sinning. But you could live the most holy life and be fully, 100% in the flesh, born of the flesh. That's it. Now we understand why the Jews are born of after the flesh. Because the life they have is born after the revelation of who I am in the flesh. And the law system. They're in the flesh. The Bible says in um, I think it's Galatians 4, it says those that are in the flesh persecute the, them that are in the spirit. So the person that believes in, in, in I am special because of my flesh, and he was talking about Jews there. Now what we've done in Christianity is we've cut out the part where you say you've got to be physically circumcised in order to be part of this Jewish covenant. Because Jesus fulfilled that. And then we just bring a person in, but we still keep the rest of the law system. Actually, preaching a gospel where we place everybody now in the flesh. Like, G like Jesus said to the disciples, you go over land and sea to make one disciple, and you make him twice as much a son of hell as what you are yourself. And he comes and def defines a hellish way of thinking, which is to think that I am what I do. I am what my flesh dictates I am, and I am what I do. That's devilish. And the Bible says that that doctrine, talking about the tongue, that preaches the doctrine of the flesh, is set alight with the fire of hell, according to James chapter 3. That's what it is. So, if we can realize the, this truth, you know, that, that kills you, that destroys your life, our heart will gravitate naturally towards love and away from the system. You know, because the law sounds good, it confuses our minds that, okay, there is some good in there. And this is what happened to, to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When they looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what did Eve, Eve see? She said, it looks beautiful. It looked good to, good for food. But when God looked at it, it didn't look beautiful to him. It didn't, didn't look as if it could make you wise. When God looked at it, it said, he says that this wisdom is not wisdom at all. When God looked at it, he says, this, I, I, I see death. When Eve looked at it, she saw life. And the very same thing with the law today. When we look at it, it might look like life, but to God, it doesn't look like life. It looks like your end. And the more we can realize that, the more we will veer away from it and we will embrace the whole system of being by gift. And what I mean by that is that we are what He gifted us with, which is Himself. Which is a free gift. Romans 7, verse 4 to 6. Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, Romans 7 verse 1, it says, I speak to those that are under the law that understand the law. In other words, those that are in the flesh. So you guys, do you understand what I mean when I say you're in the flesh? So a person's in the flesh. Okay? The whole Jewish concept of being in the flesh. So Jesus said, you have now become dead to the law by the body of Christ when Jesus came a man born of a woman under the law, born 
of the tribe of Judah, born in the flesh, uh, um, you know, uh, a Jew, and then the representative of mankind, the Jew man Jesus, went and died. What does that mean? That meant the flesh man has died, and we became dead to the law by the body of Jesus, by the kind of being that died. Okay, so we are now alive unto God, not through this law. But when they were under the law, they were bearing fruit for the law. Because in the flesh, you know, they were unified to the law. In the flesh, they boasted and, and, and waited for God and, and, and for, for, for Jesus to come. And in the flesh, they, they boasted. They were happy. They thought that this is the holiest, best system by which we can have quality of life. And God came and ended that system and that's what the preaching of Paul was all about to teach the Jewish people number one that's where he started that you are not to be in the flesh anymore but in the spirit for God gives his spirit now to every man and that the spirit of God was poured out on all flesh that's what he wanted them to believe then they almost killed him. He went away and preached to the Gentiles that because the flesh system was ended, they also not qualified because nobody according to the flesh is qualified anymore. But he is our qualification. That's why he went to the Gentiles. He preached to the Gentiles and then most of Paul's ministry was to purify the belief of the Gentiles when Judaizers came in and tried to get them back in the flesh again. Because that's what the Jews did. They, got, they, 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 they received Jesus, but they still believed that Jesus came to the Jews, you know, and, and because he came to the Jews, this covenant in Christ all was made valid when you were circumcised. So, um, yes, Jesus did come for us, but do you want to be part of what Jesus came to do? Be circumcised. You need to come into the Jewish physical flesh kind of a thing and obey the laws. Then Jesus is for you. Then you will be saved. That's what the Judaizers went and preached in all these Gentile cities where Paul preached. And that's where the whole thing comes about when Paul says, you know, there are those uh, knife-happy Judaizers. You know, that's why Paul says, I wish they cut themselves off. You know, because he was so upset with it. And that's where it comes, the whole thing comes about, you know, in the flesh and in the spirit. Then that's why Paul could say, you know, those of you that are, uh, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the flesh or the hearing of faith? Why do you, this is what he says, why do you that received salvation and received the Holy Spirit by faith want to be made perfect now by the flesh? So the flesh is not this evil system or, or, or this, this bad sinner that uses crack cocaine. We always thought, no, he's now in the flesh. Now that is a fruit of being in the flesh, but being in the flesh, like I explained to you now, is a belief system. So he says, you're a wherefore my brethren, you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him that raised you from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the passions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. When we were in the flesh, now you understand what it means to be in the flesh, to say, I'm a Jew and I believe in the law and I believe in the reign of the Messiah, and I'm going to obey the law, and if I obey the law correctly, then I will be part of the reign of the Messiah. That's what it means to be in the flesh. For when we were in the flesh, the passions of sin, which were by the law, worked death in me. Do you see what it, what it says there? Being in the flesh works death. It brings forth death. But Jesus came and ended the flesh, man, so that we will not bear forth fruit anymore unto death, but that He can bear His fruit in us. You know, this teaching that I teach here today is not even, was never even intended to ever be taught to a Gentile, ever. For they were never to even have heard about the law. It was never addressed to them, ever. But now we've got to preach to Christians and Gentile people according to the flesh 
We've got to preach a message as if we are preaching to rabbis. Mm, it's sad. But here we see it happened, started, Paul writes to the Romans, and he explains these things. He says in verse, uh, um, yeah, and the commandment which was ordained to life, talking about the Ten Commandments here, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and slew me. So, be, so what it means is when you are in the flesh, in the wrong belief, what happens? Then sin takes occasion by that commandment to kill you and manifests in you. That's why many would say, you see, he's, 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 the fact that he sins he's, 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 means he's in the flesh, which to a certain degree is correct if you understand it this way. But we were always thinking that the sin is what causes you to be in the flesh. No, being in the flesh is what causes the sin. And being in the flesh, Paul defined as observing the Ten Commandments, which the Jews called blasphemy. They want to murder him. Eventually they did. Because of what he preached there. Listen to verse 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. So in the flesh, in a, in a human body, human mind, doesn't dwell any good thing. Because of the fall of Adam. Okay, because of the disobedience of one man that came upon every person. Nothing good is, there's nothing good. So if I'm going to boast in the flesh now, and make use of the flesh, in my relationship with God, what's going to happen? The flesh is going to live, because I'm saying, I live by the flesh. I live by obedience to the law. I live by my own ability to work up my own quality of life. I'm working that up from my flesh. What happens now? Now the flesh lives. So what's happening is you are giving life to death in you, to manifest in you, because you believe in that wrong system. But, when, but Paul says here, listen to what he says, Now then, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. For to be will, to will is present with me, but how to perform that good I find not. For the good that I want to do, I do not. But the evil which I don't want to do, that I do. Now if I do that which I don't want to do, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me or in my flesh. So if you want to do something, but you can't do it, what does that mean? It means that you, by the law, try and getting something right. That's what it means. You're in the flesh, in that area. Another way, way of flesh is unbelief in God's belief for that area of your life. And thank God that there's no guilt for us anymore. So when I come and I look at my life and I look at things in my life that is not good, that is not uh, uh, pleasing to me, what do I do? I don't beat myself over the knuckles, give myself a dose of condemnation and guilt you know, or guilt for another week. I don't do that. What do I do? I say, God, my heart is open to hear what you believe about me in this area of my life. That's all. That's what you do. And you have got an expectation for God in due time to share with you what you need to hear in that area of your life. That's all. Like I spoke to somebody before the service, you know, uh, um, and what she said was, you know, once, I, once you get into grace... And, this is, and, and I've experienced it in my own life. Once you get into grace, it's almost as if your life takes a dip. You know, you don't live as holy as what you lived under the law. Because what happened was, under the law, you were using a lot of willpower to, to live up to a certain standard. But when you realize, when willpower is taken away, and who you really are, based on your belief, should manifest, then it manifests, and you see, man, I've only been believing in the flesh all the time, and now it manifests. So what happens then? Then you stay in church, and you stay in a place where the grace message is preached, and you don't embrace any other thing, so that your belief can be renewed, and in due time you will see a new life born from God. And that is the life of peace. That is the life of joy. 
That's what it's all about. You know, you can, you can get people, like the one preacher said, listen, who of you are against the grace message, stand up, you know. And if you don't stand up, you're going to go to, uh, you, you're going you're to be part of the tribulation. I mean, everybody stands up. You know, now you look at the standing, you say, look how in unity they stand, you know. Look how they stand for a holy life and everything is so good. But the moment you take the tribulation away, you will find that they're not going to stand up. Because it was never born from God, it was born from fear. And born from willpower and born from the whole thing of I don't want to be rejected by my pastor and my friends. I don't want to be uh, uh, seen as a heretic and all those kind of things. So here they stand. But the moment you take all the fear away, then the true belief is revealed. And then it looks as if all these people are just sinners. They were all the time. But it was suppressed by willpower. And now when the truth comes, you see what the person really believes. And now we are in a process of renewing of our belief. And by the renewal of the belief, we find who God is born in us. You know, I'm, I'm at a place you know, where I really feel, it's not, just, it's not a positive confession or anything, but I really feel that nothing that anybody ever takes away from me in this physical earth or give to me, talking in the area of finances, can either take anything away from me or add anything to me. And that gives you such a wonderful ability to communicate truth to any kind of a person, be he rich or be he poor, doesn't matter. Because you, I'm not in the flesh in that area of my life anymore. You know, and uh, like I want to say, don't try, and I said it many times, don't try and uh, look at if you see something wrong in your life, oh God, what, what wrong thing do I believe? The revelation of the wrong thing you believe is not going to set you free. It's the revelation of having the, believing the right thing that will set you free. Yeah. Amen. Okay, so here Paul says, let's read it again. I find then a law that when I do, want to do good, evil is present with me. Listen to what he says. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of of this death or of the flesh who shall deliver me from the system where I believe that the physical defines me when it talks about the Jewish system here he says who shall deliver me from being a Jew having a law given to me who will deliver me from the system where this sin in me manifests all the time? Then he goes on and says, I thank my God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus came and what did he do? How does he deliver man from the power of sins? This is how he delivers man. By ending the Jewish system and ending the law system. Bringing in the system originally designed for man, which is belief in who God is. Looking at God, seeing who you are. Believing in that and that delivers me. That's how I am set free. No other way. That's how I am set free. Now we understand Romans 8 verse 1 to 4. There is therefore now no... Because this condemnation that he talked about here, and I preached on this here before, this condemnation he talked about here was when... I mean, if you really understand the flesh, then you understand that the Jews were really condemned. They were condemned unto death. Because they will only die. Because they boast in their flesh, and then they try and obey the law. To have God's quality of life. And that law was even written on the hearts of the Gentiles. So the Gentiles had the very same thing. But we're just using the very clear physical manifestation of it in the Jew's life here. As a type and a shadow of what's true in every man. So here, that's why th they were condemned. Paul talks about, I was condemned. You know, to be, it's a condemnation unto death. To be a person that is married to a law then I've got to obey this law, but all this law does is it brings forth death unto me, but I'm married to this, and I cannot get free. That's condemned, man. That's a condemnation unto death. So he says, who will set me free from this condemnation? I thank God through Jesus Christ, because what had to happen for you not to be in the flesh is 
the Jewish system had to pass away, the law had to be fulfilled, and righteousness had to be given to every person so they can now believe I'm righteous, and then from that righteousness, you will find who God is manifest in your life. That's what had to be done for you to get out from under the flesh. Now he goes on in chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We are all in Christ because every, he reconciled the whole world in Christ when he was upon the cross. He says, therefore, uh, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. I mean, we are in Christ. Okay. Now how do you want no condemnation? How do you want not to be condemned unto the fruit of the flesh? And the flesh, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Do you understand flesh now? The, we are in Christ, okay? But the fact that we are in Christ does not mean that there are not people that's going to try and embrace the old system. Those that are in Christ will experience no condemnation. And I'm not using the word condemnation as the word guilt. Condemnation and guilt is not the same word. Condemned is when you are judged, found guilty, then you are condemned unto a certain sentence. Okay, or condemnation, the context here is to be condemned to a place of death where only the evil will manifest in you, eventually have its end in eternal separation from God. Now, he comes here, he says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Who are in Christ? Everybody. Who do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So we cannot walk after the flesh anymore. We cannot have any... Um, but any respect towards the old system anymore. Because in our flesh dwells nothing good. Should you in the flesh try and boast, in the flesh try and be a good person by your works and willpower, by saying, I am part of the Jewish system, or, like more relevant for Christians today, saying, I'm going to observe all these good and right things to do so that I can have a place in the reign of the Messiah. The condemnation of that is all kind of concupiscence, which means the wildest evil lust you can think of will manifest in your life. He says, we don't have that if we walk off the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. There was a law that is in Christ. That law is, if He can die for me, if He, this is the law, if He gives His life for free to us and we accept that life, then we'll have His life. That's the law. That law of life and the fact that He was raised into life representing me, believed in, has set me free from the law of sin and death. What was the law of sin and death? There was a law that Paul said, I find this law in my members, that when I try to obey works righteousness, this law is there. Then I sin and die. It has set me free through Christ Jesus. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned or ended sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the law. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 3 verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law um, there shall no flesh be justified before God. Your flesh cannot be justified before God. Your flesh can never be justified before God by the deeds of the law. That's what it says there. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That knowledge is the manifestation. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all of them that believe. For there's no difference, for all have sinned, Jew and Gentile, and come short of the glory of God. So the Jew and the Gentile needed Jesus. Okay? Listen to this. For he is not a Jew, this is Romans 2 verse 28 and 29, for he is not a Jew that is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, 
whose praise is not of men, but of God. Okay, what does he say here? He says, a true Jew is not a physical Jew. Now, the guys in America don't like what I preach when I say this. And I love you guys, but you need to accept the truth. You accept the truth. We are not anti-Semitic when we say this. But we're not going to embrace the Jew as a person and the flesh and be anti-Christ. I'd rather be labeled as anti-Semitic than being anti-Christ. And I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm saying the good news to the Jew here. The good news for the Jew is that you are not the people of God in your flesh anymore. By that truth, because Jesus was the circumcision that needed for the flesh system to pass away, to be cut off forever, you are now people of God in Christ, reconciled unto God by His doing. You don't have Jew anymore all the commandments to obey. Your righteousness is revealed in the resurrected Jesus, and you can believe it. If you don't preach that to a Jew, you don't love him. You hate him. For he is a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither, uh, uh, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. So what is true circumcision? It's when the belief of the law is cut away out of my heart. I don't believe it anymore. I believe in a new system. I don't believe in uh, 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 works righteousness anymore. I don't believe in this old Jewish system anymore. I believe what God believes. And God's belief is clearly, is made clear and portrayed in the, in the resurrected Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father, which is the truth about every man. And every person gets invited, this truth is preached to him, so that he can believe this truth, so this truth can manifest in his life. And that's what we call salvation. Amen. We are saved from the, from the law system and its manifestation. I'm going to read two more verses. It says, Beware lest, this, this is Colossians 2, verse 8 to 15. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit of the traditions of men. Do you understand here traditions of men as the Jewish system that tried to come into Colossa, you know, and they tried to bring in the traditional system and the philosophies of the Jews they wanted to bring into the Gentile system, getting them in the flesh again, to get them legalistic again. You know, Paul said, he doesn't, there's nothing wrong with the law, but what's wrong is this, that when you are under it, you die. Okay? Of the traditions of men, of the rudiments. You know, rudiments uh, uh, is a difficult old English word. It basically means laws. Okay? Which are after the laws of this world and not after Christ. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete, which is, uh, uh, which is the head of all principalities and powers. So what he says here is, listen guys, people come to you and say you are still in need of something. You've believed on Jesus. Listen to these Gentiles. Paul come, he preaches to the people in Colossa. They weren't Jews, they were just Gentiles. I'm talking f fleshly here, because you don't find a Jew and a Gentile anymore. But for understanding, okay, he comes to the people that were non-Jews. He preached to them. They, what did he preach to them? He preached to them, Jesus took away all your sin. He says, you, your sins have been taken away. I preach unto you the forgiveness of sins. You can now believe upon the Messiah that ca came, not just for Jews, but came for everybody. And you are made perfect in him. When he was raised up from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father in bodily form, he represented the whole human race, representing every one of you Gentiles as well. So you, have, you who were far off at a certain time because the law was given to the Jews and salvation was only to the Jews through the law system, you've been brought nigh now because the Jews were sinners, you were sinners, Jesus came on behalf of sinners. So that means he came for everybody, he took away all people's sin, and this, is what, this you can now believe. Then they believed it, they received the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit started manifesting in them, they received a brand new life, they're very happy, hallelujah. Now the Jews come, preach to them afterwards, vain philosophies, rudiments of this world, the laws of the world. They come to them and want to make them perfect now, saying, listen, you're now a baby Christian. You want to be a big Christian, you know? 
grown-up Christian, let me tell you about these new things. You need to be circumcised. You know What Paul preached was for you just to enter in, but now you need to obey God. And then they came with all the laws now. And that's why Paul wrote this piece. And this is what he said. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit of the traditions of men, of the rudiments of this world, and not of the Christ. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are already complete in him. You don't need to have some other law added to you, or basic principle or anything, for the fullness of the Godhead is bodily in Jesus. You have a body, so don't look at the shortcoming in your life thinking, oh my, I need a change here, I need a change there. No, where Jesus is in his body, you don't have to change anything to your body by being circumcised to think that you're going to be part of the kingdom of God. The fullness of the Godhead is in Christ and you have that fullness because he's got a physical body and you've got a physical body he represents you. You are complete. You need, don't need some Judaizer to add some law to you. That's what he says there. Now it goes on, it says, and you are complete in him which is the head of all a, a principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now listen to this. You were circumcised. These people wanted to circumcise the, Jew, the Gentiles. He says, listen, you have been circumcised by the death of Christ because when he died, the flesh man died away. So you are not in the flesh anymore. Can you see through all the scriptures, what in the flesh really means. Now, I'm going to end off by explaining, I had to say all of that to explain 1 John 1 verse 8 to 9, where it says, if you confess your sin, He's faithful and just to forgive you. A little bit of background on 1 John 1 verse 8 to 9. <clears throat> this was written to Christians about non-Christians or Antichrist people. So it was written to Christians about unbelievers. Um, you can say that the first part, he talks to Christians about what he says to non-believers. Chapter 1, let me explain it. <clears throat> the, the unbelievers here was called the Gnostics. Now what the Gnostics believed was, they believed that no man has any sin. They also believed that um, the sin of Adam couldn't influence us. There was no need for... What it means is that the sin of Adam never made anybody a sinner. We even find teachings like that today in the name of Jesus. You know, which says, oh, no, no, we are all holy, we are all righteous. You know, Jesus didn't come... To, um, to take away sin, he actually came to show you you have no sin, which is a lie. This is what the Gnostics believed. And they believed that they were just, that humans aren't sinful. That's what they believed. They, they, they did not believe that Jesus came in the flesh. I, I studied this out. This is what they believed. They didn't believe Jesus came into the flesh. They believed that he was just a, 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 a spiritual manifestation. He, he didn't really have it wasn't really physical. That's why it comes in chapter 1. He says, they say, whom we have seen, whom we have touched, whom we have felt. That's why John comes in that first part and explains Jesus did come in physical form. Because they said, no, uh, he couldn't have come in that way. Um, and there were certain reasons, which I'm not going to get into now. Then it says, he, uh, they also believed that he was not the way, but he showed the way. There are many people believing it today. Uh, believing that Jesus is not the way, they're just showing, you know, Jesus showed the way. You know, you are not guilty. You've never sinned. The sin of, the sin of Adam was, had no influence on you. You know, God was greater than any sin. You know, He saw that and forgave you even before the foundation of the world. You are not a sinner. You've never had sin. You just lived in an illusion. This is what the Gnostics believed. If that is true, then there was no need for the death of Jesus. I've listened, I've listened to a teaching the other day of a friend of mine teaching that the death of Jesus was not needed. He says all it was 
all it was, was man got in such a system of sacrifice, and they got so turned on to sacrifice, that Jesus said, well, let me talk their language. You know, so I will come through this whole sacrificial system so that they can really see they're innocent because they've never been guilty. That's a lie. It's called Gnosticism. It's in the church today. Now, those Gnostics want to be pure by, by saying, I've never been a sinner. I don't have sin. Now, John writes to those people. He writes to the Christians about those people and he says, listen, if you can confess your sin, if you can acknowledge that I do have sin, you will find that what Christ has done on the cross cleanses you from your sin. You don't have to say, I don't have sin, I don't have sin. No, 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 no. You need to acknowledge that in your flesh is nothing good. You need to acknowledge that in a human body, free from God, under a law, is the ability to die. That there's nothing good in your flesh. Confess your sin. If you say you have never sinned, in other words, if you say that this flesh, I've, I've never had this sin in my flesh and it has never brought any evil work to my life, you lie. You're just lying. Outright lying. If you say that you that you have no sin, meaning, the, the true context there, meaning that Adam's sin never had an influence on you, you also make God a liar. Because God gave His Son and said, I want to take away the sin of the world. Meaning, God is lying, saying, you've got sin. That's the true, 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 true context of First John there. And I today declare Paul was the greatest sin confessor ever in Romans 7, when he said, I find a law in my members, that when I want to do, the, do good, I can't, because there is sin in my flesh. And I needed a Jesus to take me away from the law, so that who he is can be born in me. And that is the true, true, biblical sin confession, only mentioned once in the Bible, in 1 John 1, verse 8 and 9. We've made it a thing of, we need to confess our sins, the word sin there is a noun. It's not a verb. It talks about sin in the flesh. And unfortunately, many people today, one of the greatest stumbling blocks in the Bible is Romans 7, where we say, it is not I who sin, but the sin in me. That is sin confession. It's confessing that when I'm under the law, I can never live a righteous life, for in my flesh dwells nothing good. And even if I'm in Christ, I need to walk after the Spirit, meaning I need to believe in Jesus and give no place for the law, for should I even be in Christ and I give place for the law, sin will revive and I will die. That is true, true sin confession. And I'm not scared to confess that on a daily basis. But I'm not going to call myself guilty before God a sinner before God, because I said a swear word. No way. Because my righteousness is not determined by what manifests in my flesh. Even if I believe the wrong thing, it doesn't matter. Jesus still took away my sin. But the, he, His taking away of my sin does not give me quality of life. What gives me quality of life is the belief that He did it. Hallelujah. Let's not walk in the flesh. I will easily confess sin according to this truth. Do you understand why I had to explain all those verses to, to explain the, 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 the scripture written to the Gnostics? God loves you, man. And He cares for you. And should you have sin in the flesh, the way you get free from the sin in the flesh is by acknowledging that this body can never be under law. It will kill me. And I believe upon Him. And that forgives me of the sin. What it means, forgive of sin, means to separate you from the sin. To separate you from the system in your flesh that kills you. That's what it means. And I wish the whole world can hear this message. And then a greater prayer would be that they would believe this. Because many can hear. This is what Jesus says. Many are called but few in the original 
chose it. Many are called, but few choose to believe this truth. And that's sad. You want people to know and believe this truth. If I want a lot of people to believe this truth, I must just mix it a little bit in with prosperity now. And it, we will have many more people. But when I say, listen, I don't care what car you drive. I don't care what job you have. I don't feel special if a billionaire gets saved in the church. Yeah. That doesn't add anything to me. I'm there to share with him what God added to him. Yeah. Hallelujah. And it would be a sad day for me when I respect someone with more money, yeah. with money more than a person that doesn't have money. Yeah. It would be a sad day. It was a day. That would be the day when I have embraced the law and when the flesh starts to live in me. It's a sad day. That day will be the day when I lose my joy, when I find I become depressed about people and situations. All of a sudden, my ministry will be about who can I preach to, what big church can I get, so that I can get more money. So that I can preach another place, so that I can get more money. All under, I must also provide for my children. We've got a Father that loves us. And He loved us so much that He gave His Son so that the death and the system of the flesh could forever die. Mm. Hallelujah. Father, I love You because You first loved me. And we, all of us here, our hearts overflow with gratitude for what You've done for us. You've been good to us. So, so good. In the beginning when I heard that you love me, I just thought that you overlooked my sin. And then I thought that free from tithing you can make me rich. But I've come to understand that you've ended the system that defines the rich as the blessed. You've ended the system that if, where I'm defined by my works and you've introduced you as my inheritance where I can have the highest quality of life because I am one with the almighty God where I'm seated around the table with you in beautiful conversation with the almighty where who you are is born in us by simple belief that we are co-seated with you. We have been chosen by you. We've been chosen to be loved on. We've been chosen to be the object on which God will pour out divinity. Thank you for that, my God. Thank you that we don't have to deny that that which Adam have done to be innocent today because we know your blood really made us innocent. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in your death and in your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't come in your death and resurrection just to adapt to a human system, but you have really come to end that which kills us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, let's have some coffee and fellowship together. Those of you that want to give, you can give in the back. I'll be here next Sunday. I'll still preach here. After that, I'm going to go to the United States for more than a month. So, uh, you know, thanks for coming.